So what is real forgiveness? What's it about? In this message, I hope to explain to you what it means to you that forgiveness is unconditional. And I hope that you will go away from here with an understanding of not minimizing uh, the seriousness of forgiveness and, and what that's all about. And, and uh, we open with our anchor passage, which uh, Nick shared a little bit earlier with you, Luke 23, 34. And the backdrop for that is Jesus uh, hanging on the cross, as he stated, and he makes this statement in Luke 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I come to understand that most people do not understand what forgiveness is really all about, what it really means. And so I'd like to start this morning, and I hope most of you got a copy of Sermon Notes, but if you didn't, you can, you can kind of mentally keep track of this. And we're going to go through a little quiz here. It's true and false. There are five questions. And see if we really do understand what forgiveness is all about. So uh, put a T if you have your notes there beside uh, each the question if you think it's true. Put an F if you think it's false. We'll start here with number one. A person should not be forgiven until they ask for it. A person should not be forgiven until they ask for it. Put T for true, F for fault. Number two, forgiving includes minimizing the offense and the pain that it caused. Forgiving includes minimizing the offense and the pain it caused. Number three, Forgiveness includes restoring trust and reuniting a relationship. Forgiveness includes restoring trust and reuniting a relationship. Number four. You have not really forgiven until you have forgotten the offense. You've not really forgiven until you have forgotten the offense. And finally, number five, when I see somebody hurt, it is my duty to forgive the offender. When I see somebody hurt, it is my duty to forgive the offender. All right, everyone have all their answers? When we take a look and we read God's Word and study the truths around forgiveness, what you're going to find is that all five of these statements are false. All five of these statements are false. Now, do I have your attention? When I say that most people do not really understand forgiveness, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I don't really think we get our minds around what forgiveness is all about. So I want us to look at what real forgiveness looks like. I want us to look at, at why we have to forgive people who hurt us, and I, I want us to look at the how to forgive. Let's start with what is real forgiveness. And maybe we best start by so, show, telling you the things that it is not. So we'll do these four statements of things that forgiveness is not. First of all, it is not conditional. In John chapter 8, verse 10, then Jesus stood up again and he said to her, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, sir, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Real forgiveness is unconditional. In other words, there, there are no strings attached to it. You and I received forgiveness and we didn't earn it. We, we didn't deserve it. We... We can't, we can't bargain for it. We read just a moment ago our anchor passage for this morning. It's Jesus there on the cross. No one is asking him for forgiveness at that point, but he is saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Forgiveness is not based on a promise to, to never do it again. There are no strings. There are no conditions. Forgiveness. Now, now that's, I want you to clearly understand that when people are 
you know, uh, doing something that requires that they be forgiven for, it doesn't mean that we need to constantly, you know, allow them right into our, our, the very wellspring of our heart. The Bible talks about guard the, your, your, the well, your heart. It's the wellspring of your soul that we need to protect ourselves. So there are, there are times that we need to put up appropriate boundaries. Everybody follow me and understand? You know, you, you fool me once, shame on you. <laughs> you fool me twice, shame on you type thing. So that's not what we're talking about. But what we're talking about is the, the very act of forgiving. We can forgive people and still have a boundary, right? I forgive you, but you have a knife. I'm not necessarily going to turn my back on you, okay? I'm just going to watch you, but I do forgive you. <laughs> and so that we're clear on that and we understand that real forgiveness is unconditional, though. In other words, there, there, there are no, no strings that are attached to it. So if you put an if condition on forgiving, then what you're doing is, is bargaining. You're not forgiving. So when we put in if, I forgive you, but you know, here's what needs to happen going forward, then that's not true forgiveness. When Jesus said while on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he, he did it without anyone asking him. When God sent his son in the fullness of time, to become the sacrifice for us. He did that because he loves us and he wanted us to have forgiveness for our sins if we desire and want to have a relationship with him. Forgiveness is not conditional. Secondly, forgiveness is not minimize the seriousness of the fence. Forgiveness does not minimize the seriousness of of the offense. I want us to try for a moment to get our minds around what forgiveness is for us. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, he rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of his dear son by whom we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. Forgiveness True forgiveness does in no way minimize the seriousness of the offense. The next time someone comes to you and they are asking for your forgiveness for something that they have in some way wronged you in your life, and you respond to them, oh, it's no big deal. It didn't really, you know, it didn't bother me. And, and probably lying about it. What you are also doing is minimizing forgiveness. And, and I just read, it's big. What happened for us is huge. And we received it freely, but we understand the cost of it. The price that was paid for our forgiveness. The blood that was shed. And so when someone comes asking us, we need to be able to look them in the eye and say, brother, sister, Thank you for coming. That was something that, you know, was difficult. I, I forgive you. I let you go. I release you. Not minimizing what has happened and what took place. And I think the reason why sometimes that we may minimize it is because we, we don't understand the difference between being wounded and being wronged. And I want to take just a moment to talk about that. Being wounded and being wronged, okay? When you are wounded, often it is, it is a result of, of something that's happened in life. And, and many times the person who wounds us may not have intentionally sought to do that. They, they may have... Uh, you know, just overlooked a situation, not been as cautious or as careful as they should have been, not been as considerate as they should have been, but they're, they didn't wake up that morning thinking, you know, I, man, I'm going to go out and hurt somebody or whatever. And so the wounded part of it, you know, what we need when we're wounded is we need some, we need time to heal. We need some compassion and we need some understanding, but we don't necessarily need forgiveness, Right. We just need those things, and we can process and heal uh, the wounds that take place in our life. Now, when you've been wronged, that is something that is done intentionally. Someone intentionally wrongs you. 
And when you are wronged, that is something that requires forgiveness. Someone who wounds may do it unintentionally. You know, I, I walked past you. I didn't shake your hand. And, and you thought, you know, I just was ignoring you. Uh, or it could be, you know, uh, to some other level. And, and you are a little wounded by it. But I didn't wrong you. And I didn't plan on, wrong, you know, doing something that, that would be wrong for you or hurtful to you. And so, but when someone wrongs us, they do it purposefully. They do it with the intent of, of uh, you know, causing some pain and some suffering in our lives. And if, and if someone doesn't uh, like the way that your hair is, you know, they don't need to be forgiven. They just need to reach a place of acceptance. This is my hair. <laughs> this is the way it is. This is the way God gave it to me. And I take it off every night. No, that's not... <laughs> Not true. But we don't need their forgiveness, right? I mean, you get wounded, you know, because people say stuff about you, you know. Uh, I've, I've had backhanded compliments before, you know. You know, this, boy, that was a great message, you know. Last week I was kind of worrying about you, you know, because it just didn't, you know, didn't make sense. And you were just circling. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but, you know, when... Uh, all we need in that case is we, we just need people to eventually kind of accept us for who we are, you know, the person that we are. But we certainly do not need their forgiveness. But forgiveness is, is a big thing, and we need not minimize it. Forgiveness is, you know, if something rises to the level that it needs forgiveness, we need to recognize and act as if it does and respond to one another and treat one another because we're going to talk about some steps in a moment that are required in forgiveness. Forgive, true forgiveness is, you know, is, is a process. It's not an event. Oop, I'm sorry. You know, it's a process, and there are steps to it. So we'll, we'll touch on that in just a moment. But forgiveness is the big stuff, right? All right, moving on to number three. Forgiveness is not resuming a relationship without change. Forgiveness is not resuming a relationship without change. Forgiveness... Uh, you know, when we forgive someone for, for what they've done, then we, we are going to, and this is where we're going to go into these steps, we're going to need to see them taking these steps. We will, forgiveness is right there. You know, that's, we freely received it, you have it. But as we are restoring and repairing this relationship, there are some steps here that need to take place. And God has set those steps in motion for us as well, Right? when we come to him and ask for forgiveness. And these are the three things that, that it takes to resume a broken relationship. When we, when we wrong someone, we break the relationship, we violate trust in order to restore that relationship and, and get it back on good grounds. These are the steps that we need to take according to scripture. Number one is repentance, right? You must be genuinely repentant. And the correct language for us is not I'm sorry, but the correct language is, I was wrong, please forgive me. We talked about last night, if you watched Happy Days, that, um, you know, uh, who was uh, the Fonz? You know, he couldn't say wrong, right? He'd say, he couldn't say he was wrong. I was, I was, I was, he could, couldn't do it. But you and I have to do it. We have to do it. When we wrong someone, we, the correct language is, I was wrong, please forgive me. Can we practice that on our neighbor? Just turn to your neighbor right there and say, I was wrong, please forgive me. Now, if there's no immediate neighbor, be sure to turn around to a person by you there and say, hey, I was wrong, please forgive me. It's not even easy when we know people, is it? <laughs> I mean, Think about how hard this is, you know, in friendships. Because we, we are the three people, right? The person that we are, the person we think we are, and we're the person we want people to see. That's what we push out front. Look how great I am, the person that I want you to see. And that person doesn't want to move to the back when we say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Repentance. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion, you bring me fruit or meats of repentance. I want to I want to see that you're really sorry and that you're really repentant. Uh, Luke chapter 17 verse 3, so watch what you do if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Right? The second step here is restitution. Restitution. 
Now, when we break relationship, we may have done so, you know, and it may involve some physical or material, um, you know, restitution. An example, if I borrowed your lawnmower and I bring it back and it's all broken, you know, blade is snapped and, you know, it's just, it's kind of in bad shape and it's dirty. And I just like, I'm, I'm in a hurry and I drop it off and I'm saying, really sorry, oops, it's broken. And, you know, yeah, just, you know, forgive me. And, and I, I have an appointment, I got to go. And, uh, you know, that's going to, you know, wait, wait, wait a minute, you know. I think you need to get this thing fixed because I still need it. I let you borrow it, but I need it. And uh, so sometimes it may involve uh, restitution, and that restitution may not be material. It might be the part of our working uh, restitution back within relationships may involve us showing people our actions of love and caring for their life and not just saying, hey, I love you and hey, I care about you, but putting some action to those words. Showing them, I really want to repair this relationship. I really want to be a part of your life again. I really want to help you in every way that I can. So the second step is restitution. And finally, the third step is uh, rebuilding trust. And this takes a long time. Forgiveness is instantaneous. You know, we forgive instantly as God forgives us. But rebuilding trust is, is hard work to rebuild it. I gave the example last night talking about the, over the 30 years of ministry, 30 plus years, the many couples that have come in that have had different kinds of things going on in their lives. And it's so sad when there's a situation where uh, one of the, the couples, you know, the man or the woman has been unfaithful. And it, it's so great that they're there and they want to heal the marriage and the relationship and stuff like that. But it is, it is a struggle. It's difficult going forward. And so we, you know, I've had the privilege of just seeing some, some marriages really healed and God do some wonderful things over the years in bringing those kinds of relationships where trust has been violated back together. But often it'll be a situation where a gentleman will come uh, to me, you know, th who is, uh, go they're going through counseling. At some point he'll come back to me and he'll say, you know, we're doing great. Um, God's doing some, some awesome things in our life. And and I'm just so thankful for what God's doing. But, you know, I, I, I keep catching, and I'm changing names, I keep catching Sarah, you know, going through my wallet, and she's going through my phone, and, and she's pouring through my closet, and, and you know, uh, looking in my car and stuff like that. And, and I have to say, hey, you know, that's what you signed up for. You know, when, when you violated trust, you now have to rebuild it, and you signed up for it. And I, I know it's painful, but you need to be as helpful as possible and just say, hey, honey, I'm going to lay these things here every night. If you need to go through them every night, then I want to rebuild trust. I want you to be able to go through and read all my texts and read, you know, go through my, my uh, wallet, go through my car, whatever you need to do that makes you feel comfortable because I'm about us rebuilding trust and restoring a relationship. Now, certainly something like that can go to an excess where it shouldn't, but the point is, when we're rebuilding trust, we need to be serious about rebuilding that trust and in every way be helpful to restoring the relationship that has been broken or been violated. Number four, forgiveness is not forgetting what has happened. Forgiveness is not forgetting what has happened. I want to like, I hope these are healing words for some people who, who have grown up hearing. How many of you grew up hearing that you really haven't forgiven until you've forgotten? It, any of you? Now, I know I've talked to some people over my life it, it, that's really been a struggle for them because they don't feel like they've really forgiven it because they, they can remember it. It's pretty clear. And in, the, you know, in... Um, I grew up in the in, in, teenager in the 70s, and there was a group called Sticks. Anybody remember Sticks? Okay, uh, spelled S T Y X. Now they got their name uh, from Greek mythology, and that uh, there's a river in Greek mythology. They say that that is in the the belly of hell, and that river flows through hell, and it's called Styx. And what Styx is uh, as a river is it's a it's a place where all people who who are in hell it's a saving grace of hell. They can go to that river and they can drink the waters from that river and, it, and, it, and they forget everything. 
All of their past is gone. They forget why they're there, who they hurt, who they wounded. They forget the suffering that they're going through. They can just stay there and drink and constantly forget. And that's the only saving grace, according to Greek mythology, of hell. Now, we know that that river is not in hell, but that river is in heaven. I don't know, it's not called sticks, but it's called the river of forgetfulness because God said, I am going to cast, or the sea of forgetfulness, all of your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. Now, God can do that. God can forget it and wipe it out and, and blot out all of our sins, the handwriting that's against us. But you and I, we can't. We have uh, this thing called a memory. And we remember the pain and the suffering and the stuff that takes place. So the first thing I want to try to do for you today is help you be kind of uh, free from the understanding that you're going to need to forget. We can forgive. We can choose not to be bitter. We, can, um, we, are, we are told to pray for those who've wronged us out of Luke chapter 6, verse 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. But here's what I've discovered in my walk with Christ, if, it, if it'll help you, and I hope it does. Number one is, I've discovered that if I stop repeating, reliving, and rehearsing those events where I was wronged and wounded in my life, that the details of that begin to fade. I've lived in times, and maybe you have as well, where you know, I was wronged and I felt like it was my job to tell everybody about it. And so I, almost daily I would relive it, I would rehearse it, and I would repeat it, and all of the details of it stayed very fresh in my mind. I could smell the smells, I could see the color of people's clothes, I could see what their eyes looked like. Man, I would vividly describe the event blow by blow to people who wanted to hear about it. You know, you finally tell awful stories to your friends long enough, they don't want to hear them, and the, you know, you start finding that your friends don't come around as often, you know. They just don't want to be around the negativity and the stuff that's going on. And so then I learned that I needed to stop reliving, stop rehearsing, and stop repeating this. And when I did that, what I found was that the, the details of it started fading. They started slipping away. And I still remember you know, who did it and that I was wronged, but I have honestly forgotten a lot of the details that I probably used to give blow by blow to people who were close to me, who I thought needed to hear what I, how I had been wronged and how I had suffered. The second thing I found in, in my walk in living for Christ is, is that as I keep my focus on the next steps that Jesus has in mind, I, I exhaust any energy that could be directed at recalibrating my past. When I zero in on what Jesus has for me for my next steps, I literally become too wearied by being involved and engaged in what God has me to do to go back here and try to recalibrate my past and, and figure it out and, and fix things. I don't have the energy for it because I'm zeroed in on what God wants me to do in the next steps, and he will keep you busy. I love what Rick Warren said in his, in his uh, book, The Purpose Driven Church. He said, there are two kinds of people in church. There's going to be those who row the boat and those who rock the boat. You know? <laughs> and I'm not a rocker. I'm rowing and I'm exhausted. I am so tired from that. And I'm focused in on, on what God has in store for me and what's just ahead of us. And, and God wants, I think, all of us to do that. The third thing that I've discovered is that the sooner I forgive... The sooner I can move forward, I can put closure to my life. I can release that person. They may or may not be, remain in my life as a close individual depending on what they do. Are they repenting? Are they trying to uh, do restitution? Are they, are they looking to rebuild the trust and, and help this relationship come together? That's not in my, you know, the only thing that's in my court is to forgive them. You know, I forgave you, and, and I'm going to move on with the things that God has for me. You want to continue to be in my life? You know, I'm open to us having some kind of relationship. Go through those steps. Let's do it together. Two keys to forgiving that is going to help us understand how we um, are to, you know, the importance of us forgiving and, and how we are to forgive. The first one is, key number one, forgiveness is remembering how much that you have been forgiven. The real key to, to, to being good at forgiving 
is to be able to get your mind around how great it is to be forgiven, how much God has forgiven you of. Um, Nick, I think, also read uh, a little bit of this passage uh, a moment ago. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. This is the starting point for genuine forgiveness. If you don't feel forgiven, uh, you are going to struggle with forgiving other people that are around your life. And if you have a hard time yourself, then, then you know, forgiving yourself and, and forgiving those around you, you're going you're gonna to struggle and have a hard time with, uh, in, in every situation that rises up where forgiveness is needed to be extended. But the more grace that you receive from God, the more gracious that you can be with others. And as we open ourselves up to the understanding of how much God has forgiven us, it makes it so much easier for us to extend that forgiveness to others. Key number two, forgiveness is relinquishing your right to get even. Relinquishing your right to get even. There are a lot of people who are just waiting for the right moment. And they, they you know, there's, when the tables turn, I'm going to get even. Because you wronged me, and I'm going to straighten this thing out. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Never avenge yourself. Leave that to God. For he has said that he will repay those who deserve it. You know, life is not fair. You're going to be wounded. Jesus told those who would follow him. He said, it's impossible, but what offenses must come. Breaking that down into common English, there is absolutely nothing you can do to keep yourself from being wronged and offended. Nothing. Not even if you live in the house all by yourself and try to be a hermit and stay away from people, you are going to, you'll offend yourself. <laughs> right? Anybody talk to their self? Answer themselves? You'll offend yourself at some point. So it is impossible, he says. So you got to live. Okay, you got to exist. You got to get out there and you got to forgive and you got to move forward. You know, and, uh, and, and, and this is the only way to do it is, is, to, is to release people, to forgive them, to advance uh, towards God and the things that he has in store for you. But understand this. Who would you rather have dealing with the situation? Do you think you're a better, uh, you can get, set the record straight and, and make the scales level, or do you think God can? God can. Um, a couple of decades ago, uh, someone in my life, wounded me deeply in a in a very hurtful way and and could have done much more damage except that uh, I think that there was enough of an understanding of people around me of who I was and who this person was and I remember hurting so bad and starting to think you know I'm you know at some point I'm gonna I want to see this person suffer I remember God speaking to me about six months into this and saying, there's going to be a day you're going to weep for this person. And, uh, you know, I wish I could say I was real pastoral and say, oh, God, you know. But you know what I said? Ha! That day will not happen. The wound was so tender, so deep, and so all-encompassing. I'm like, that will never happen. It wasn't six months later that I was on my knees saying, God, show mercy to this person and spill some of that over here. I'll take it. I can't bear to watch them suffer like this. God is the one who will even the justice scales. And you do not want to be in his way. You do not want to try to put anything on those scales. You want to be in a place where you say, God, I surrender. I forgive and release and let go. Because there will come that day for you too where your heart will break for those who have wronged. And it might not even be in this life. It might be in the resurrection of the dead where you see the separation of those that are God's sheep and those that are not, that your eyes will be filled with tears for those who are separated forever from the one who loves us and made us and created us. 
I'm inviting the worship team to come. Several years ago, Michelle and I were reading a book. It was written by John Brevere. He titled the book, The Bait of Satan. Among other things that John talked about in this particular book, he talked about uh, how we can be caught up by the enemy or baited into uh, taking on the offenses of other people around us. One of the questions that we asked earlier uh, for you was, you know, you see someone that's offended, is it your job to forgive the offender? And he talked about us trying to get involved in those kinds of things and how the enemy uses that to really destroy our lives along with the, the person who's being wounded. It is our job to minister to people who are hurting and lift them up and encourage them and pray with them. We are, we are not to be those who take a position and, you know, we're going to forgive that person. We're not going to forgive them. We're going to become an enemy of them. We're going to start a campaign against them. Remember, it's God that's, that's equaling out and leveling the thing out and taking care of it. And he cautioned, you know, and, it, and this book was so, so well written, if you get a chance uh, to read it, it is, it is very powerful. He really cautioned us as, um, you know, as a church, the church of Jesus Christ, that we would respond appropriately in, in, in our forgiveness with one another and not allow offenses to creep up in our lives. And really understand the difference between being wounded and being wronged, okay? You get wounded, you know, you may need some time to heal. You need some acceptance, some understanding. You're wronged, you know, you need, you know, to offer forgiveness. You need to receive um, forgiveness on that end. The very first kind of giving that the world ever knew was forgiveness. God sent his only son, gave as a gift to us for our sins, he died, a gift for all of us. One of the greatest joys in our life in Christ is to live generously and to share what God has given to us. But when we refuse to forgive, we close the door on both the gift and the giver. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Here's our motivation for forgiving. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Let's stand together.